I mean, the, the crackdown has been incredibly successful in terms of reducing the size of, of the shadow banking sector relative to the Chinese economy. I mean, if you go back to 2016, uh, we were looking at a shadow banking sector that was around 86% of GDP equivalent. Now it's down to just over 50%. So if the objective of the Chinese authorities has been to reduce the size of the sector and to de-risk it, uh, I think they've had some success in that. Okay, and this, of course, has, all has to do with uh, uh, Beijing's intention of trying to maintain or establish uh, financial stability, right, or stability in the, in the financial system. Uh, paramount, though, for China for I don't know how long has always been social stability. But here there is a connection, and help, help the talk us through this, uh, it, it's because with shadow banking and with property, you're talking about risk being concentrated uh, in the wealthy here, right? That, you know, some guy who's over leveraged, who owns three condos or four condos, is going to get hurt badly. But that's, in, in a sense, okay, because that helps to eventually, potentially, narrow the income gap between him and the guy who doesn't even have a house or a condo and is still renting. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's a lot of things going on at the moment. I mean, one of them is the common prosperity agenda that the, the government has, has put quite a lot of emphasis on recently. And that's all about addressing inequality in terms of uh, the, the wealth gap that's grown up in China. And, and some of that is uh, basically related to, uh, to, to trying to, to, to bring down the, the inequalities in, in, uh, in wealth and in income. Um, and then there's also this, this issue that the Chinese leadership keep referring to about property being for living in and not for speculation. And of course, one of the issues there in China has been that for many um, middle class people in China, property has been the investment of choice. So that, that property has been used as, as essentially a vehicle for savings. Um, and again, the, I think there's an encouragement to try to develop alternative savings vehicles uh, so that uh, property becomes a, a less obvious uh, store of, of value. So that I think there are a number of things going on here. And then finally, there's the, the deleveraging story as well. I mean, that's been going on for some years, and that's part of the story around shadow banking. Uh, it's basic, the, the, the crackdown on shadow banking was basically an attempt to crack down on uh, growing leverage in certain sectors, and, and property development has been one of those. Uh, so by reducing the share of, of credit provided by shadow banks, that's had a knock-on effect in terms of developers. Maybe not the, the, the really big uh, developers like Evergrande, uh, which have been less reliant on shadow banking, but certainly for many of the smaller property developers, shadow banking was an important source of finance. So this is uh, one way in which you can try and reduce leverage in the sector. 